Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our study of the book of Leviticus, the book of holiness. I'm John Walker, and along with others, I'm sitting with Bruce Wadsick, the minister of the Princeton Church of Christ. Bruce, where are we in our study of Leviticus? We're in the second half of the book of Leviticus. Starting in chapter 18, uh, scholars call the rest of the book uh, the code of holiness. So in the first part, it talked about how they were to sacrifice. It talked about the distinction clean from unclean, a variety of different subjects like that. But starting in chapter 18, it's getting down to the moral code and the daily life code there to live by. Their God is a holy God. Our God is a holy God. Therefore, if we want to be in fellowship with him and remain in fellowship, and for them, it had to do with his presence in the tabernacle. For us, it's the presence of the spirit in our life. We have to be in a process of sanctification, uh, becoming holy as he is holy. And so he's defining these things for the Israelites. They've been in Egypt for hundreds of years, and uh, the Egyptians' morality is certainly not God's morality. They're fixing to go into the land of Canaan. And the Canaanites are more ungodly than the Egyptians. And so he doesn't want them to be like them. So he's defining in clear terms <clears throat> what his expectations are for his covenant people as uh, they seek to live under the reign of God as their one true king. So we pick up in chapter uh, 20, or last week we look at chapter 19. And the bottom line of that chapter, uh, love your neighbors yourself, we find that every, every aspect of your life came under holiness to God. It's not like some religious life and the rest of your life didn't. But every dimension of their life came under what it meant to be uh, holy people uh, living uh, with the holy God. And so again, in chapter 20, we'll pick up where we left off. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, say to the people of Israel, any one of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel who gives any of his children to Moloch shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I myself will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given one of his children to Moloch to make my sanctuary unclean and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do at all close their eyes to that man when he gives one of his children to Moloch and do not put him to death, then I will set my face against that man and against his clan and will cut them off from among their people, him and all who follow him in whoring after Moloch. Bruce, who is Moloch and how would they give their children to him? Uh, Moloch was uh, worshiped throughout the ancient Middle East uh, we know especially the Sea people that later became the Philistines, uh, but had roots all the way up to Carthage in the ancient times and the Greeks. Uh, they worship Moloch. It appears that they believe Moloch was a god of the underworld, a god that lived where the dead were. Uh, and they believed if they gave their child, which meant to sacrifice their child, so it was a child sacrifice and usually done by fire that they could get the blessings of the God of Moloch in whatever way they needed a particular blessing. And so this was a detestable practice uh, that was going on in the land of Canaan. And so, so right off the bat, God defines a forms of terrible idolatry as something that will not be tolerated uh, and this kind of treatment of people's children would not be tolerated. And anyone that did this was to be put to death, and not just by any way, but they were to be put to death by stoning. That's a pretty tough way, not a quick way to die. Um, and then he goes on to say, if people overlook this sin and don't, uh, prosecute the person that does it, I will turn my face against these people. And the idea of turning your face against it is the idea 
that you're trying to communicate with somebody and they turn their back on you. So God's back is to, to you. So you can talk all day, I can't hear you. Not going to respond to you, not going to help you. You're on your own. And so if they wanted to be abandoned by God, then they would imitate this godless uh, idolatry worship by sacrificing kids to Moloch. And if so, anyone that chose to do that was to be executed. Now, you know, uh, we could say there's some correlation to, between that and some of our modern practice of abortion, but it's not exactly the same thing. These usually were very young children, uh, but they were at least uh, born. Um, but idolatry in our day is a little more disguised. I think Jesus caught the gist of it quite well in the Sermon on the Mount uh, in Matthew uh, 6 and verse uh, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Now, the word translated money here is the Aramaic word, because that was the language they spoke, not Greek, which New Testament written, and Jesus spoke Aramaic. Mammon was a word for possession. And so they translate it money because in our society, it's all about the Benjamin, all about the dollar, all about your money. And I would say that probably the root idolatry in our society is the worship of money. Uh, people will kill other people. If you pay them the right amount of money, they'll, they'll do all kinds of terrible things. They'll sacrifice their family in other ways you pay them a high enough salary, they'll not spend a minute with their family and devote their life to the uh, corporation. Um, you have to be careful living in a society like that, just as he warned the Israelites about the kind of world they were going to be entering in Canaan. We need to be aware of the dangers of the idolatry of money. Uh, it's obviously in a practical sense, money is needed. Uh, to live and survive and function in this society, but it's the uh, devotion to money that's the issue. Jesus said, you know, you can't really serve two masters. you got to make a choice. It's got to be either God or money. Now, a lot of people want the, uh, both God and money. Matter of fact, they think their God is going to give them the money, but these are two separate things. And if we're devoted to money as much as we are to God, we're just idolaters and polytheists that, that worship more than one God. And so just as Israelites were warned against Moloch worship and the terrible cost that was inflicted on the children by the worship of Moloch, um, we need to be careful in our day uh, that we don't sacrifice our children in the sense of turn them into money grubbers or for the sake of money, uh, neglect our children. So good morning, idolatry in every generation is such a serious sin that God gave the capital punishment as the correct way to deal <clears throat> with such behavior. Now let's go back to chapter 20, pick up the verse uh, six. If a person turns to mediums and necromancers whoring after them, I will set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. Consecrate, consecrate, consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. For anyone who curses his father or his mother shall, shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother his blood is upon him. Bruce, how does God sanctify or consecrate his people? Yeah, it's interesting here. God says you have to be made holy. It's a process of consecration 
our sanctification and God says, I'm going to sanctify you. But he says, you have to sanctify yourself. God tells us what his will is, what's right and what's wrong. And then it's our responsibility to put into practice what we learn. That's how God sanctifies us. When we believe his word and we don't do the things we know are contrary to his will and we do the things we know are in sync with God's will. Now it's interesting. <clears throat> he first of all mentions, uh, I shall not tolerate people among you that turn to mediums or necromancers. This may be a, a tie in to what we've just uh, dealt with, where he warned against uh, Moloch. And Moloch is one of the gods of the dead. Necromancing and mediums are usually trying to talk with these spirits or the spirits of ancestors or uh, something like that. And so it's a kind of continuation of uh, a form of idolatry. And of course, in our day, we have people that claim to be able to conduct seances where you can contact dead relatives. All of that is foolish and an evil practice. And such people, the Lord said, should be cut off. Um, <clears throat> this is also a sin under the New Testament. Not every single thing that the, the law of Moses says is a sin, that was a sin for them, is for us. But uh, witchcraft would be the basic term under which this law was one of the works of the flesh. In Galatians 5, uh, verse 19 through 21. So, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sexuality, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So just like under the Old Testament, God is very clear about what he will tolerate and what he will not tolerate. And here's a list of sins that God says are clear evidence that uh, the flesh is in control of your life. And one of those, in our translation, uh, it translates sorcery, like the King James translates it uh, witchcraft. But it's clear that the same sort of thing of mediums and necromancers uh, any attempt to engage the spiritual world apart directly from God himself uh, is not to be tolerated. But then it's it interesting, the next thing after idolatry is about family. And again, it's about the parents and what the attitude <clears throat> of the child uh, should be says, for anyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father and his mother. His blood is upon them. And we don't oftentimes think, you know, uh, disobedient, uh, rebellious uh, children that whose mouths are full of curses. And of course, uh, this curse doesn't mean like we do is cursing, you know, saying bad words. Cursing means he would call down terrible things to happen to his parents, that kind of curse in contrast to a blessing. But the penalty for a child, and this would be a grown adult too, that cursed his parents, death. Again, God is teaching a profound truth. Idolatry will rot your soul. And unless you have healthy, respectful family life, you won't have a society. It's when uh, parents are not respected, when children are not loved, when appropriate sexual boundaries are not respected, we find families falling apart, lives falling apart, and the cement of civilization is the family. And when the family falls apart, uh, your civilization is a long after. And so right off the bat, just like in the Ten Commandments, it starts off with worship no other gods, have no graven images. 
And uh, then he goes down to saying, honor your mother and your father. So this is one of the key commands. And here it's just looking at it from a different angle and saying if a child goes so far as to curse their parents, they're to be put to death. A pretty profound thing. In our day, we of course, we can't even conceive of such a thing. Of course, remember, uh, Leviticus is a part of the law of the land. You know, when we read the New Testament, it's, it's God's will for his covenant people under the new covenant, but it's not the law of the land of America or any other country. You know, we live in a society of mixed pluralistic values, some Christian, but a mixture of all kinds of pagan values as well. But Israel wants to be a theocracy. Therefore, they must follow God's law and cursing parents is not going to be uh, tolerated under this. Let's look at uh, Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, that reminds us the importance of children's relationship with their parents under the new code. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Isn't it interesting? It goes back and quotes one of the Ten Commandments. The first man with a promise. What's the promise? Long life. So if you don't honor your parents, what's the opposite of that? A short life. Under the old covenant, if you dishonored your parents by cursing them, you'd have a very short life. You would be executed publicly. So, very serious matter. Uh, sometimes we think, you know, uh, obeying parents is kind of a, a nice thing, uh, but I think our society has gone from one extreme. I think maybe when I was young, uh, parents were pretty brutal at times with kids. Now we've gone to the other extreme, I think, with kids in many cases. You know, effective, loving discipline is needed in every generation. But no matter how you treat your children, your children have a choice of whether they obey or respect and honor you, and that will determine how long they're going to live on the earth. Interesting fact. So he starts off by outlining these key things as a part of what is going to be expected of God's holy people. Go back to chapter 20 of Leviticus, pick up the verse 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. If a man lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood is upon them. If a man lies with a male, as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man takes a woman and her mother also, it is depravity, and he and they shall be burned with fire, that there may be no depravity among you. If a man lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death and you shall kill the animal. If a woman approaches any animal and lies with it, you shall kill the, kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Who's what sins were considered serious enough for the death penalty? It kind of reminds us of what we covered already in chapter 18. As a matter of fact, it goes into even more detail about what is not permitted for the covenant people of God. And mostly it has to do with uh, respecting extended family, you know, not marrying within an extended family, respecting aunts and uncles, and, you know, mothers and their daughter, not uh, disrespecting by uh, being involved sexually with both. And of course, adultery. Um, 
clear violation also was serious stuff. So these are all sexual sins, but it's really a disrespect for the covenant of marriage and what marriage meant and the kind of person you could marry uh, that God sanctioned. Uh, and then, of course, men having sex with one another, homosexuality, another death penalty, a sexual sin. Then it talks about having sex with animals. Uh, that sounds very uh, strange to us, but we know from some of the writings uh, of the, about the Canaanites that they practice that as part of their religious worship, their fertility uh, cult. So these were bizarre things that were practiced by the Canaanites. And all I would say is, if no one's doing this yet in America, just give them a little time. Uh, we've been going through a, I don't, I don't want to call it a sexual revolution, a sexual de devolution, a repaganization of America, especially with sexual ethics. Uh, and uh, if we haven't got here yet, we'll be there soon. They'll be, uh, <clears throat> you know, making people, uh, putting it into law that you can have sex with animals or something, and marry your animal, perhaps. Uh, it's crazy stuff. It sounds like perhaps too far today, but if I told you uh, 30 years ago that uh, homosexuals would be legally married, you'd say, oh, that'll never happen. So it just, it's just a matter of time. Once you go down a road of disrespecting uh, sexual boundaries, you eventually slide into total depravity and degradation. And notice one of these even says, put them to death. They should be put to death by fire. So they're to be burned. Like, so you, not to burn your children alive, sacrifice them all. But if someone does some of these detestable things, they're to be put to death as adults, uh, even by fire. So pretty, pretty powerful uh, word. Uh, to get a feel for this, this, this idea of uh, being worthy of death, I'd like us to notice uh, a passage we're familiar with, but maybe we haven't paid enough attention to how this uh, in chapter ends in uh, Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 24, going through the rest of the chapter, ending at verse 32. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies in, among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worship and served the, cre the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. I want us just to notice how this ends. Though they know God's righteous decree, so people innately know there's a moral law, that, that those who practice such things deserve to die. They deserve to die. It does mean uh, that they're going to die instantaneously, but they have a moral sense that, you know, what they're doing is deserving of death. But not only do they do it, but they go around creating a society of approval for those that do the same thing. 
But notice where it all starts. It starts back when he says the exchange, instead of worshiping God, they start worshiping creatures. So the core sin behind other sin is always idolatry. If one worships uh, uh, the sexual body or sexuality, then one's going to do all kinds of things. You worship money, you're going to do all kinds of it. So a lot of these sins have to do with things people do because they no longer worship the true creator God and respect him and give thanks to him or acknowledge him. And instead, they've given themselves over uh, to their own selfish and foolish passions. And that's what makes the world you and I live in a dangerous, a painful, and difficult. And notice they know that those who do such things deserve to die. So back in Leviticus, he said not only did they deserve to die, they need to die. You, you can't tolerate certain people promoting certain things uh, in a society without corrupting the whole society. So God's remedy was to eliminate the evil doer. Let's go back to chapter 20 and pick up with uh, verse 17. If a man takes his sister a daughter of his father or a daughter of his mother and sees her nakedness and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace and they shall be cut off in the sight of the children of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness and he shall bear his iniquity. If a man lies with a woman during her menstrual period and uncovers her nakedness, he has made naked her fountain and, shall, and, has, and she has uncovered the fountain of her blood. Both of them shall be cut off from among their people. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister or of your father's sister, for that is to make naked one's relative. They shall bear their iniquity. If a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die, die childless. If a man takes his brother's wife, it is impurity. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Who's what is the penalty for these sins? I notice none of these say overtly that uh, they are to suffer the death penalty. It says they shall be cut off from their people. Now the question becomes, uh, is that a euphemism or kill them? Or is he talking about kicking them out? of the civilized community, you cut them off. You no longer associate with them. They have to live outside of civilized society. They have to go out in the desert and be a nomad, no longer have uh, relationships. No one does business with them. Uh, it's, it's at least that. They shall bear their iniquity. And then he says, for some of these sins, they shall be childless. Now, actually, the Hebrew uh, we're uncertain. This word they translate here, childless, we're not really sure uh, what that word means. And so maybe it's saying they'll be childless. The rabbis tended to believe that was what this was. Uh, we can't be for sure. But one way or another, the people that continued these sins, if it wasn't as grave as public execution, they at least were kicked out of civilized society and not allowed to continue on uh, because of these types uh, of sins. And some of this we've dealt with before, things that sound very uh, strange uh, to us, that having to do with menstrual blood because, because it was blood. And uh, that was considered sacred. That's why uh, you were not to engage in sexual intercourse during the period of menstruation. So uh, God is outlining a clear, moral code and is saying you've got to get rid of cut them off let them bear their iniquity or execute people that flagrantly violate the will of god or else you won't have a covenant community you won't have a holy people you won't have a righteous nation 
you'll simply have another pagan nation that claims to worship Yahweh. And of course, if you read the rest of the story of the Old Testament, unfortunately, throughout much of their history, they didn't live up to these moral expectations. They were idolaters, sexually immoral, and immoral in every kind of way. And this immorality was tolerated until God finally allowed the Babylonians and Assyrians to carry off his people into exile. So God's clear warnings are here. These are the clear parameters of right and wrong. Uh, you can heed it and remain in relationship with the living God or violate it and be cut off from God. Then uh, verse 22. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my rules and do them, that the land where I am bringing you to live may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the customs of the nations that I am driving out before you, for they did for they did all these things, and therefore I detested them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, who has separated you from the peoples. Bruce, why did the land vomit up the Canaanites? That's a pretty vivid image. Um, and of course that means the land is rejecting them. Well, why? Because some of the very things that already God has outlined as ungodly behavior the Israelites were not to do <clears throat> were the very things the Canaanites were doing. Not only what we've covered thus far, but there's a whole lot more that the Canaanites were doing that were wrong. And so God is warning them, if the land vomited them up, and I'm allowing you to go in and take over the land, that should be a clear warning. If you replicate their moral life, will not the land vomit you up too? Uh, and so he says, you shall inherit this land, I'll give it to you to possess, a land flowing with milk and honey. So God had promised Abraham and he was about to fulfill his promise by giving the land to the descendants of Abraham because he says, I am the Lord your God. That's why they are to be holy. That's why they're not to follow in the example of the Canaanites. Then the concluding verses, verse 25 to 27. You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean and the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or by anything with which the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. A man or woman who is a medium or a necromancer shall surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Bruce, what was the purpose behind God's statutes? So here he explains to them, why am I giving you these instructions, statutes, and rules? He says, first of all, the verse just before, that I am the Lord, your God, who has separated you from the people, all the other nations. You shall therefore separate clean and unclean animals which he delineate others. You shall be holy. So God's purpose for his law is to allow the people of Israel to be separate, different, distinct from the other nations. He didn't want them to mimic all the sins of the other nations. He wanted them to be a holy nation. He wanted them to be a royal priesthood. Uh, he wanted them to show uh, God's holy character through their life so they, as a nation, uh, could influence the whole world. And in a certain way, they have, because we're reading the scriptures God originally gave through Moses to the Israelites, and that's how we know who God is 
and how we know of right from wrong. So even though the people of Israel failed to live up to the covenant time to time, a written record of that covenant uh, stood as not only uh, evidence against them when they violated the covenant, but as evidence to the whole world, anyone that wanted to learn what's right and what's wrong, what God considers to be holy and unholy, clean or unclean. So the goal was to separate them uh, from the other people so that they would not get caught up in all the sins of the other people. The New Testament has a similar idea. Uh, Second uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 14 through 17. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. Yeah, so actually uh, one quote from Leviticus. So what is God saying? Some people think he's talking about marriage. I, I don't really think he is. I think he's talking more broadly. Uh, on one hand, uh, he warns the Corinthians, look, I'm not saying you can't have any association at all with ungodly people, or you couldn't live in the city you live in. It's filled with all kinds of ungodly people. But there's a difference between living in the same neighborhood and becoming partner with them, yoked with them, with unbelievers. Um, you know, we have to be careful about that. Um, I think about a, a powerful example to me. Uh, my wife's father was a, a, a really wise and godly man. He had a, a business that was very successful, and two lawyers in town came to him with a proposition. These were two worldly guys. They were going to put up the money, and he was going to become a distributor of electronic equipment, uh, move to a major city and distribute all over the state. And it could have been a very lucrative uh, uh, transaction. And so he agreed to do it. And unfortunately, he did it on a handshake. And these were two worldly guys. He moved to another city, moved his family there, ordered all this equipment. Uh, to the warehouse, then these two guys that were going to provide the money to pay for it, suddenly there was a government contract where if they put their money in that, they could get their money back doubled in uh, three years, which is a lot quicker. So they just pulled all the money out and left Becky's dad holding the bag. And he had to go and get a big loan. He spent the rest of his life paying off the debt that was incurred. And what did he do? He went into partnership with unbelievers. He went into partnership with people he shouldn't trust. And it cost him uh, his livelihood. But Becky remembers the day. They were uh, a well-to-do family in our town, and they became part of the poor family in our town overnight because he got involved with two lawyers that were unbelievers and unscrupulous and sold him out. Uh, but what do you expect worldly people to do? Uh, and so I think that's a warning here. We need to be separate, but in, in the sense, you know, don't go into business with worldly people and not expect to be taken advantage of. If you do, you better have a written contract. You better write in every stipulation known to man because you cannot trust uh, worldly people. What does a believer have to do with uh, Bilal, which is a Hebrew word for the evil one or Satan? Uh, we are the temple of the living God. We, we're not compatible with idolaters. And so I will make my dwelling among you 
and will walk among you. And I will be your God, and they shall be my people. That's what God wants, both under the old covenant, but now today, by living in our hearts and lives in the presence of the Holy Spirit, God wants to be in our midst. But we too have to be serious about living a holy and godly life. And the New Testament is very clear about works of the flesh and things that are sinful and ungodly. Uh, and just because our society doesn't think those things are wrong doesn't change reality. God is always telling us the truth. And it's only when we believe him, we realize we have to be somewhat separate from the world and how they operate or else how are we going to influence the world? We're just like them. Then we can have no possible influence on them. So God is calling us, like he called Israel, to be a holy people. He doesn't call for us to be self-righteous. He doesn't call for us to be holier than thou. He just calls upon us to have high moral ethics and to live up to those. God will give us the power to do the right thing through the presence of the Spirit if we are willing to. God's word is clear. He'll sanctify us. In addition to what the Israelites had, God's word, we have the living presence of the Holy Spirit in us to enable us to live out God's statutes and will. So therefore, just as God called Israel, God is calling us into covenant relationship to live a holy life. And by the power of God, by the grace of God, I pray all of us will begin to live more and more of that kind of life that God is calling us to. God, would you close us out with a word of prayer? Father, we come to you humbly, Lord, uh, giving you honor and praise for being uh, an awesome and mighty God. We thank you, Lord, for calling us to be your people, being our God through our faith and obedience to the call of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that uh, for all of the souls here uh, present and all of those who are, will be watching this on the recorded version, that alike we are here for the express purpose of growing in the knowledge of your word. We thank you for Bruce and his ability to teach us so plainly that we might be equipped to endure spiritual battles, trusting in you. Father, we ask uh, especially uh, for you to be present and to tend to the needs of uh, our brothers and sisters who are in need in a special way for needs of comfort and healing. And Father, we thank you for <clears throat> the rich family, continue to be with them as, our dear brother Dan has gone home to you, but uh, be with Phyllis, his spouse of 46 years and, and uh, their children and the rest of their family. We thank you for his example and uh, that we would continue on the legacy of a good Christian man. Father, we thank you for our dear sister Becky as uh, she is enduring her own uh, uh, health concerns. And Father, we trust in you, Lord, that you are a healer and we thank you lord that healing will be and uh, will manifest itself in a way that is uh, beneficial uh, to each of us but father you will be glorified in such healing and so we thank you for becky's faith and for the contributions she's made to your kingdom here on earth teaching and mentoring and discipling people for decades as a faithful servant continue to be with our sister sharon during her uh, own uh, journey with uh, her medical issues. Father, we pray your comfort and confidence uh, that she and her trust and faith uh, in you will also be at peace when a diagnosis will be discovered and shared uh, for her concerns. Father, we thank you. Uh, we bless your name for it is in Jesus' name this prayer and all prayers are asked. Amen.